welcome to the study. I hope you are well today. I'm very glad to see you here. I have something lovely and special today to share with you. so many lovely messages from viewers and I want to say thank you. You're all really beautiful. Beautiful people. And it's a real pleasure to make videos for you. Enjoy. And sorry if you can hear a little bit of my breathing as well. I'll try to be a little bit quieter as we Maybe you like the book. Do you 
Scottish architects called Robert Adam. He toured Europe in the 1760s. book with his drawings and plans and architectural observance observations of the ruins of Diocletian the palace. just going to be the age of the Enlightenment. And you can see how detailed his sketches were. Since the beginning of the 18th century. 
each corner in the 
Byzantine manor. It is considered one of Wren's finest church interiors. Next, the brothers visited St. Paul's Cathedral itself, which sits on Ludgate Hill, the highest point of the City of London, dedicated to Paul the Apostle. The earlier Gothic Cathedral, founded in 604, was largely destroyed in the Great Fire, had been a central focus for London, including Paul's Walk and St. Paul's Churchyard. Being the site of St. Paul's Cross, the new church, which can be seen today, was completed in 1710 and was designed in the English Baroque style as part of the major rebuilding program initiated in the aftermath of the Great Fire. It is one of the most famous and recognisable sites of London. Its dome, surrounded by the spires of Wren's city churches, has dominated the skyline for over 300 years. At 365 feet high, it was the tallest building in London, until about 1963. The dome is still one of the highest in the world. After London, the brothers went to the countryside. They visited Windsor Castle in Berkshire in the company of Thomas Sandby, who showed them his landscaping for Windsor Great Park and the Virginia Water Lake. set off on the 28th of October, 1754, sailing from Dover to Calais. There they joined Charles Hope Weir, brother of Earl of Hope Town in Brussels. Charles and Robert attended a play and a masquerade, and visited churches and palaces of Brussels. Charles was inspired to accompany Robert, at the suggestion of his uncle, the Marquis of Annandale, who had himself undertaken the grand tour in his youth. James stayed in Brussels, and Robert and Charles made their way towards Rome. First they went to Tournai, and then Lille, where they visited the Citadel, designed by Sébastien Le Prestre de Vauban. In Paris, they took lodgings in the Hotel de Notre Dame, and then on to Italy. By the time they were staying in Rome, they had a disagreement over travelling expenses and accommodation. Robert stayed on in Rome until 1757 studying classical architecture and polishing up his drawing skills. Indulging his interest in architecture, he took lessons from the French architect and artist Charles-Louis Clarisseau and the Italian artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi, acquainting himself with the work of the pioneer classical archaeologist and art historian, theorist Johann Joachim Winkelmann. On his return journey, Robert and Clarisseau spent time intensively studying the ruins of Diocletian's palace in Spalatro Dalmatia. These studies published in 1764. Robert and James returned to Britain in 1758 and set up in business in London, designing complete schemes for the decoration and furnishing of houses. 
houses. Robert designed a number of country houses in the popular Palladian style, but evolving it by incorporating elements of classical Roman design alongside Greek, Byzantine, Egyptian and Baroque styles. They designed every detail, creating a sense of unity in design and flexibility in style. Robert developed a distinctive and highly individual style, applied to all elements of interior decoration, from ceilings, walls and floors, to furniture, silver and ceramics. The Adam style, as it became known, was enormously popular and had a lasting influence on British architecture and interior design. Furnishings and the decoration of a room were designed in accord, creating a unified harmony. Even the carpets were woven to match the intricate patterns of the ceilings above, and every fitting, including sconces, mirrors and doorknobs, reflected the motifs of the room and unified the space. Adam rejected some of the Palladian style as introduced to England by Inigo Jones, but continued the tradition of drawing inspiration directly from classical antiquity. Adam's new style of architectural decoration was more archaeologically accurate than past neoclassical styles, but also innovative and not bound only by classical precedents. The discoveries in Herculaneum and Pompeii, ongoing at the time, provided a plethora of material for Robert to draw upon for his inspiration. Adam's own theory of design was based on the principle of movement. The rise and fall, an advancing and recessing of forms, the essence of the Adam style, lay in this use of ornament. Another crucial element was his insistence on a stylistic coherence across every element of his interiors. Encouraged by the relative ease with which repetitious and regular neoclassical ornament could be produced in flat patterns or in low relief, which could be easily fitted together in different combinations. The Adam Brothers' lavish publication, Works of Architecture, published in parts from 1773, played a significant role in the dissemination of their style, and included illustrations encouraging the idea of the total interior. This established their reputation as great architects. In it, they stated that Greco-Roman examples should serve as models, which we should imitate and as standards by which we ought to judge. Adam's own version of the neoclassical set off a revolution in style. His distinctive decorative system used a limited range of ornament, distilled by combining the classical and renaissance examples wall paintings, and room decorations. By the early 1760s, Robert had developed a form of interior decoration that merged classical elements with modern uses. Ceilings and walls, and often floors, were covered with continuous areas of small-scale ornament, playing down the architectural definition. 
while early Georgian interiors were strict, mathematically proportioned. Robert favored curved walls and domes, making a sort of movement. His plaster work itself was intricate and detailed. Pastel color schemes dominated with much broader color palette than had previously been seen in the grand houses. Robert used greens, blues, lemons, lilacs, and pinks, and occasionally the darker colors if the room so required. By contrasting the room sizes and decorative schemes, Robert applied the concept of movement to his interiors as he did his exteriors, and his style was soon described as classical Rococo. Robert's work had influenced the direction of architecture and design across the Western world. In England, his collaboration with Thomas Chippendale resulted in some of the finest neoclassicist designs of the time. Most notably, Harewood House near Leeds. Robert commissioned work from Thomas Chippendale, dubbed the Shakespeare of English Furniture, a self-made Yorkshire cabinet maker and interior designer, who had set up in St. Martin's Lane in London. Chippendale had published The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Directory in 1754. From this, Adam could shop with a selection of 160 pieces in the directory to suit his palatial interiors. The interiors and furniture at Harewood would end up costing more than the house itself. The fusion of Adam's architecture and Chippendale's superb quality in 12 key bespoke projects would make them aesthetic superstars with a reach from the Russian court to the Americas. Robert Adam was elected a fellow of the Society for Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce in 1758 and of the Society of Antiquaries in 1761. The same year he was appointed architect of the King's Works, jointly with Sir William Chambers. His younger brother James succeeded him in this post when he relinquished the role in 1768 in order to devote more time to his elected office as Member of Parliament for Kinross Shire. Lord Bute, a fellow Scot and minister of King George III, aided Robert in being appointed as royal architect, together with William Chambers. In 1774, Adam designed the beautiful Pulteney Bridge in Bath that features shops and overlooks the River Avon in the city that was the playground of the aristocracy. including now John as well, had established themselves in the business. The Strand had become the theatre of one of London's most ambitious and monumental architectural enterprises, the Adelphi. Robert and his brothers endeavoured to create a large and entirely new district of elegant housing, raised up some extraordinary engineering on a series of vaulted warehouses above the River Thames, on what had been an unfashionable and dilapidated stretch of ground. In 1768, the brothers took the lease for the site of a former Episcopal palace, Durham House, that was built for the Bishop of Durham in 1345. It had been confiscated and resold several times, and Samuel Pepys wrote about a fire that a house
house in Durham Yard burned down in 1669, only having been stopped by the demolition of another adjacent house. Despite the state of Durham House, the Strand had become a growing business area and was the site of the new exchange built by Inigo Jones, the Palladian restoration architect, and development of Covent Garden Market. Although the new exchange had been shut down in 1737, Robert and his brothers saw the potential of the Durham estate and set in motion a grand plan of covering the dilapidated and forlorn area of Durham House estate with buildings of magnificent and harmonious scale, adopting for the place the Greek name Adelphoi or Adelphi, meaning brothers. The grandeur of the Adelphi sprung from its imposing dimensions, comprising forty-one bays visible from the Thames, making it the first great riverside composition in London. Two flanking pavilions featured double pilastered, flat rectangular decorative columns and garlanded pediments. To compensate for the slope of the terrain descending towards the river, the Adam brothers built a series of large arches to support the Adelphi Terrace. These vaults were rented by the brothers to the government to help finance the project. Robert's genius lay in his ability to take and adapt elements of the antique architecture and create from them something uniquely his own. With the Adelphi, his principal inspiration was the ruined palace of Diocletian. The way Robert, the foremost architect of the brothers, highlighted the external and central bays without downplaying the others, demonstrated his great talent. The finesse of the ornamentation, not its exuberance, is most striking. Robert had been transformation of the palace had split into a bustling modern city, as well as by its Roman remains. This aspect he reinterpreted for London as a mixed environment of houses of several different sizes and classes, arranged in a grid of streets, along with the shops, coffee houses, tavern, hotel, bank, and a new Adam-designed headquarters for the Royal Society of Arts on John Adam Street, one of the streets named after the brothers, all underpinned by the cavernous wharves and warehouses. showed the fine balance between ornament and plain surface at which Robert excelled, with relatively simple brick facades enlivened by ornamental stucco pilasters emblazoned with honeysuckle motifs, and tablet chairs, string courses, decorative door cases, and iron balconies. The interiors were decorated in the distinctive Adam style, 
with decorative plus to work on walls and ceilings and carved chimney pieces. The house at the center of the royal terrace, taken by the actor David Garrick, a friend of the Adams, was especially fine with painted panels by Antonio Zucchi incorporated into its main drawing room ceiling and a staircase with bronze balustrade. Though bold in its architecture and engineering, as a financial venture, the Adelphi was risky and impetuous, coming uncomfortably soon after the Adams had agreed with the Duke of Portland to build Portland Place on his estate at Marlebone. Another ambitious town planning commitment, and the houses were not selling at their full valuation. Badly overstretched, and with many properties unfinished, the Adam brothers were forced to mortgage houses or sell them cheaply in order to raise capital to finish the development of the Adelphi. The Scottish banking crash in the summer of 1772 almost saw them ruined. The sale of these assets by a private lottery saved them from bankruptcy, but their reputation had been tarnished and they were never able to regain the heights of their earlier successes. The name Adelphi, chosen to immortalize the Adam Brotherhood, also became a byword for overreaching ambition. The Adelphi survived in relatively good condition into the 19th century, though its immediate connection to the riverfront, a fundamental element of the design, was lost when the Thames was pushed back and the Victoria Embankment and Gardens were created in front of it between 1864 and 1870. Then, in 1872, shortly after the lease had been renewed, heavy Victorian window dressings and a large pediment were added to the Adelphi Terrace facade, disrupting its careful proportions. Also, by then, the vaults beneath had become infamous as a haunt of the poor, the homeless, and outcasts of society. In 1927, the Adelphi estate was sold at auction, and in 1936, many of the houses, including the Great Riverfront Terrace and its underground vaults, were torn down to make way for a new Art Deco Adelphi building. His death in 1792, Robert Adam had won all the most glittering prizes, the last of which was to be buried in Westminster Abbey. Each of his pallbearers, one duke, three earls, one lord and one baronet, was a former client. In North America, the federal style owes much to neoclassicism of Robert Adam. In Europe, Robert notably influenced Charles Cameron, the Scotsman who designed Sarskoye Selo and other Russian palaces for Catherine the Great.
to yourself. Be kind to others. 